Good morning, Cross Point. Morning. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving to you late. Hope you had a great holiday, whatever, you, whatever that looked like for you. Hope you found some time to pause and be thankful. It is good that we have times when we can pause and stop and reflect and be thankful. I think about a time when um, I invited my life group over to our house. And I have this friend. It's uh, pretty tall. It's a really musical uh, kind of guy, really gifted musically. Um, he was born in Mexico. Uh, let's call him, keep uh, his identity safe, let's call him uh, Bill. <laughs> and um, so he came over to my house, and he walked in the front, and he came in through the kitchen, because you know everybody stands in the kitchen. But before he got to the kitchen, he stopped and he said, hey, what's, what's uh, going on here on, on, with the floor? And I said, oh, well, you know, we bought this house and I had to, it took the carpet out. I put this floor in there and where the new floor hit the tile for the kitchen, yeah, I just never kind of got around to putting like a little transition there. Uh, so thank you very much for calling me out for that, Bill. <laughs> uh, and he said, well, you know, there's this principle. He said, you know, once you see something like 12 times, I'm sure it was an arbitrary number, but he said, once you see something like 12 times, you stop seeing it. And so he said, you know, it's, it's good to go ahead and see that stuff and to address it, fix it up. And you guys know about this. You've got that hole in your, in your wall where the door handle's gone through that happened like six years ago and you just, you forgot about it. Or some of you guys have your check engine light on. It's been on for six months. Right, you just kind of got used to it. You don't even see it anymore. It's this principle in psychology, they call it habituation. And what, what that means is that your response to a stimulus decreases with either prolonged or repeated exposure to what you're seeing. And you know what, guys? You know what I think happens, too, is we're, we can be like that in our lives with the blessings in our lives. I think that we can sometimes neglect to be thankful or, or to have gratitude for things that are huge blessings. And you know this. I mean, you're going to leave when, when we finish today, you're going to leave and you're going to go get in that same car that you've got in a thousand times before. And then you'll pull up to home, whatever home is, you're going to pull up to the same home, the same driveway or parking lot or garage that you pull into every day, you pull out of every day. Some of us clock in to the same place of work that we've been at for 15 or 20 years. Some of us wake up next to the same person we've been waking up to for a lot of years. And so here, here's why I think it's good. We need to pause and acknowledge and recognize these blessings so that we can be thankful and there's this verse that the Apostle Paul wrote in the letter to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 7, and uh, it's not on the screen, but I think it's just, it's a great verse for thinking about how do we be more thankful. And Paul wrote this, he said, let your roots sink deep in him, in Jesus. He said, build your life on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you've been taught and you'll overflow with thanksgiving. So that's my uh, effort this morning, is just that so we can do a couple simple things together so that we can strengthen our faith by looking at the truth, and that would lead us to a place of, of overflowing thankfulness and gratitude. So we're gonna look, if you like God's word, if you like scripture, you're gonna get a healthy dose of it today. It might feel... Um, a little scattered here and there, but my scriptures come primarily from four different sections. We're going to look at 1 Peter 4, Colossians 4, Ephesians 4, and then we'll throw in some Romans 12 for good measure. But you know what? That passage about being sinking roots into Jesus, even that image, if I could give you before we begin today an image to think about, to think about roots sinking in and standing firm. I love what Anthony shared last week about the church being a support for one another, this family. Do you know the, the redwoods? You're familiar with the redwood tree? That the way the root system works in many of those is to not go super deep, but to, go, to spread out into what they do is they thatch together with others that are nearby in many cases. And because of their connectedness, 
that gives them the ability to stand strong. So today, as we see a lot of different scriptures, I hope you'll see that, that interthatching of God's word. And really, the way I arrived at our, at our message for today is just this. I've spent a lot of time reading the New Testament, as many of you have as well. And I think that it gives a lot of advice, instruction for healthy living, for holy living, for living a, 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 a holy and thankful and a life full of gratitude. So I have identified what I think are a few holiday hacks for us to take a look at today. And when I say hack, I'm not talking about the job I had done with the flooring in my kitchen. I'm talking about this definition, that Webster, you have to go down a lot of different uh, options in Webster to find this definition. It's a noun. It says it's a clever tip or technique for doing or improving something. So the holidays we know are a joyful time. They're wonderful, right? Most wonderful time of year, except for the fact that there's also a lot of stress involved, and it can be really tricky because you're dealing with family, and I could probably stop there, (laughs) but you're also dealing with finances, and you're dealing with uh, different relational strains, coworkers, and so forth. One of the things we're dealing with is the fact that our calendars, despite many people getting some time off, that our calendars are fuller than ever at this time of year, aren't they? So today's hacks are are just this. They're hacks for Christ followers to try to navigate this holiday season with grace. Now, our family gatherings, most of us will be a part of some family gathering. You did last week, perhaps, and you'll probably do uh, next month as well. Man, they look so different. Many of us will be around in-laws, right? Some of us might be around exes. Some of us might be around so-and-so's new boyfriend or girlfriend. Some of us might be at a gathering for the first time without someone. We'll all be at some type of a work party, or at least in traffic, or probably at the post office. So (laughs) we're going to need some help to navigate this season, keep our heads on straight, and to more than that, to be a a proper ambassador of Jesus Christ, and to point people towards him with the joy that we have. We'll look at some common holiday things, and we'll try to stretch these out so that we can maximize the connection that we really need. So there was a passage in Anthony's message last week that I think really sets this up beautifully. I wanna return to that real quickly and you can follow it along on your screen. If you have the YouVersion app on your phone, today might be a good day to try out following along there. Like I said, there's gonna be a lot of scriptures. You might wanna return back to it later. You can always find that and follow it here. But the scripture is on the screen as well. So from 1 Peter chapter four, starting in verse eight, Peter wrote this, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Hack number one is this. Don't just say grace, but extend grace. Many of us say grace, especially around a Thanksgiving table or Christmas meal. But don't let that be enough. Extend grace to those who need it, which is probably everyone you know, and it's probably you as well. Here's the thing. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul wrote this in verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, be watchful and thankful. So prayer is extremely important, and being thankful is important. But just a couple of verse, uh, verses later in, in verses 5 and 6, he says this, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity I love this. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. On Thursday, uh, my wife made some excellent mashed potatoes, and before we left to go uh, where we were going, she came uh, 
with a spoon. And she said, try this. <laughs> and I tried it. And of course, I said, that's excellent. And she said, does it need more salt? And it did not. It was perfect. You nailed it, babe. Great job. But salt is such a key ingredient, isn't it? Because it does way more than make something have uh, a salty flavor. It enhances the other flavors. It opens up our ability uh, to taste other things. And you know this, if you've made chocolate chip cookies, at least good ones, you know that salt can actually help make things taste sweeter in the right amounts. So our conversations can do this as well. Our conversations, if they are full of grace, can help open up an opportunity for something to be improved, which I love. So not just at the holidays and not just at meals, but we should live a grace-filled life. Our conversations should be full of grace. And here's, to be a little more specific, here's some help with this. How to show grace. First of all, quickly. As quickly as you can. And it's challenging. If you've been offended, if you've been hurt, if something has transpired, it's challenging. But as quickly as you can, the worship team has some values that we hold. One of them is to extend grace quickly. And I'm thankful for that one. It's important because uh, our, our team is a team of volunteers, and all of us make mistakes all the time. But if we approach this with a position of we're going to extend grace quickly, then we can move past that. We can keep the most important thing the most important, and that is glorifying Jesus with our songs. Here's another tip how to extend grace. Do it freely. Do it freely. And what I mean by that is this. You're not a bank. You're not a mortgage lender. You don't need to give a grace period to someone that, well, if they come and apologize to me within the next couple of weeks, I can move past it. We can go forward with this. Don't put some end date on it. Man, they haven't, I haven't heard from them in six months. I'm done with them. Don't do that to them. And also, church, don't do that to yourself. This is important. The last thing is to extend grace genuinely. And that's from 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, where he said this, most important of all, continue to Show deep love for each other. Deep love, a genuine love, not something that's surface. For love covers a multitude of sins, and that love covering will allow you to move forward. Extend that grace. The Mayo Clinic has their own reasons for extending grace or for uh, offering forgiveness to someone. Amongst the things that forgiving others can do for you and for your health a whole host of things like less anxiety, fewer symptoms of depression, lower blood pressure, a stronger immune system, improved heart health. I mean, forgiving others and extending that grace is such a helpful thing for you. In Ephesians, Paul wrote, chapter 4, get rid of all bitterness, rage, Anger, what types of things are those? Internal. Things that could raise your blood pressure, things that could impact your heart health. And he went on to say, get rid of harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Again, in Romans same author, the Apostle Paul, wrote this, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. All that you can. So what you, what you can do to live in peace is to start by extending grace when it's required, and it's required often. I have a couple of uh, pieces of advice for, for grace, for getting to a point where you can extend grace to others. The first one is this, to acknowledge your own need. You need grace. You needed it, and you still do. Ephesians 2.8 says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. 
And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. So a great starting point is to acknowledge your own need. And the second thing you could do is this, to keep some gift receipts. Keep some gift receipts. What do I mean by that? Well, John, verse 1, chapter 16 says this, from his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. Every good and perfect gift has come from the above, and they are gracious blessings to us. So hang on to those receipts, not because you'll ever want to give it back, because you need to remember who it was that gave you that gracious blessing. And that can help you to be gracious as well. Hack number two for us, how to survive this holiday season, is to don't just say a blessing, but be a blessing. Be a blessing. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus does something that's really important. It's really familiar for many of us. He teaches his disciples to pray, and he uses the Lord's Prayer. It's beautiful. It's eloquent. It's very important. Prayer is so important. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus extends, and he clarifies this, that he didn't just come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So don't just say a blessing, although that's important, but be a blessing. Serve others. We know that actions speak much louder than words, and that's what happened when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. It was difficult for them to allow him to do that, and he said, you call me teacher, you call me Lord, and you're right, but now I will show you the full extent of my love by serving you. I think that's beautiful. And I think, church, uh, and don't miss this, because our, our message today is a little bit different in style, but don't miss this. Jesus gave his life for you. And his obedience to go to the cross, to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many, it's the greatest example of being a blessing, laying down his life that we'll ever see. He set that example for us. Don't just say a blessing, although that's important, but be a blessing to others. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, he said this. I read it at the beginning. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Boy, that can be challenging. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Another translation says that we are stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I absolutely love that, that you and I would be stewards of his grace. In Romans 12, Paul said this, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Now listen, so if God's given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. There's a takeaway there that I see. Paul seems to acknowledge that being kind to some people takes serious giftedness (laughs) or that it's not always easy to be kind to others. Right? Some friends of ours at a, another church in town, they, they made these awesome shirts that say, dude, be kind. And I think that's awesome. I think what a great message. And I think a lot of times, though, it's hard. <laughs> the idea that some people would be especially gifted to be kind towards others, right? Well, maybe I didn't get that full dose, right? But we still need to. It's still important. There's a couple of realizations that I see from Scripture is that sometimes you have to overcome your negative tendencies. 
Ephesians 4.28 says, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Overcome negative tendencies. If you are gravitated towards something negative, that that could be redeemed and could be used to be a blessing to others. I think that's fantastic. And the second thing I notice here is that sometimes you have to just simply remember to be a blessing. Oh, yeah, that's right. (laughs) I'm not supposed to be a jerk. I'm supposed to be a blessing. Hebrews 13, verse 16 says this, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Often you have to overcome your negative tendencies. Many times you simply have to remember to do good and to be a blessing. Hack number three this morning, don't just give thanks, but actually say thanks. There is power in our words. Acknowledging our things we're thankful for is, is a wonderful step, but acting and sharing and speaking that is a fantastic follow-up. Again, from Ephesians 4 in verse 29, Paul said, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. The idea of overcoming habituation, overcoming uh, just failing to acknowledge blessings, failing to appreciate things we should be thankful for, getting past that is a big step. To begin to see and acknowledge and, and be thankful for things is a big step. But actually telling people that we're thankful for them is a next level thing. And I encourage us all to do that. Here's the crazy thing, church. It's so easy. It's so easy to say thank you. Think of someone now. Someone that comes to mind you're thankful for. Why not do this? Why not take your phone out of your pocket or your purse and just say thank you? And you can follow up later, and you will, because they probably will reach out. And what will they say? For what? And now you can, have, you can finish the conversation after our service. But I encourage you. Why not? Don't forget. Don't wait. If someone came to mind right now, just take your phone out for 20 seconds and type thank you. And the reason is to, to remind us all that it's so easy. Why don't we do it more often? Peter said in chapter 4, do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. And you might think, well, I don't have the gift of speaking. Well, then text like God himself is texting through you. (laughs) You can do it. You've got skills. Saying thank you is good for your health. Scripture supports this. The book of Proverbs, with so much insight, tells us in a couple of different places, in chapter 16, verse 24, that kind words are like honey. They're sweet to the soul and healthy to the body. Something sweet and healthy. Sign me up. Proverbs 18, verse 20 says this, wise words satisfy like a good meal. The right words bring satisfaction. This is the idea of putting on the stretchy pants last Thursday because you're going to have this satisfying meal. Well, spiritually, you can enjoy that sentiment by sharing kind and wise words with others. We have one more hack, hack number four. Don't just give presents, be present. And church family, I think we all know how important this distinction is. I think we can all sense it. 
It's so important that we, next week, will begin a new series called Christmas Presents, with a C-E at the end, where we will look closer and more deeply at Jesus' presence with us as he came to earth, the greatest gift, and also our presence with others. So I hope you'll be here next week and throughout the month of December to follow along with that. I don't have facts to support this, but my sense is that we live in a society that has never been more distracted than we are now. And it's probably true that we've never needed real connection more than we do now. We shouldn't just give presents. That's nice. That's wonderful. But that's easy. We need to be present. In Scripture, Jesus gave two women an absolute master class in prioritizing. It's found in Luke chapter 10. I'd like to read this to you. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. His sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big meal she was preparing. Boy, is that relatable. It's her house, her place, it's her guests, it's her meal. And she is what? Distracted. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. I have to wonder sometimes, when will we discover it? Honestly, and of course, the most important of all focus would be that we, that we would listen intently to the teachings of Jesus and learn to live like he did. But even beyond that, that we would discover the importance of being present, of setting aside distractions, and to be present. My wife gave me a coffee mug, um, and on it, it just says, Dad, your presence matters. I have, we have two children. And she, she is exactly right, and the mug is exactly right. As a father, my presence does very much matter. And so I'm thankful for that reminder. I want to say this to you, church. Your presence matters to someone, probably to many people. Your presence absolutely matters. And distractions are everywhere at all times. They are not hard to find. They are hard to set aside. But your presence matters. So here I'll give some final advice from God's word on actually how to be present. I want you to listen to this. You might want to come back to this later. From Romans 12, verses 15 and 16. It's so simple, church. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Here are some hacks I've identified from God's word. I hope they're helpful. First of all, extend grace. Guys, as you approach this holiday season and the different settings that you'll be in, a wonderful starting place would be to extend grace either to someone who has said or done something who needs grace, or maybe you want to preload some grace for what somebody you're going to encounter is going to say or do. It's almost a sure thing. 
that would be a wonderful starting point. Then be a blessing. Help someone. Serve somehow. Be a steward of God's grace. Be a blessing to someone. And when someone blesses you, say thanks. Acknowledge it. Tell them. Tell them why. Tell them what they did that you're thankful for. Tell them how it impacted you. And finally, be present. Be there. That time, that moment is fleeting. It's here and it's gone. And you don't want to miss it, I promise you. These are truths that can build our faith and help us to be thankful. They'll help us to navigate this holiday season living grace-filled lives. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for your word. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this guidance, this direction. Thank you, Lord, for this holiday season where we get to gather together with friends and family and loved ones and coworkers and so many different circles that we're in, God, and they can be challenging, but you supply the grace needed. And you've gifted us all in unique ways. God, help us to use them to serve others well. Help us to keep your son Jesus as the focus. We pray in Jesus' name.